from the fourth gospel, the gospel of John. In the third chapter, the first nine verses. Yeah, maybe we'll read the first ten. John 3, John 3, beginning at verse 1. If you have it in your Bible, maybe you stand with me as we read together as you are able. John, the third chapter. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. <laughs> I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, and there we find these words. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Please be seated. For a moment, I want to talk to you from this topic that stakes is high. Stakes is high. Jesus is visited by this Pharisee. He's visited by this Pharisee named Nicodemus who comes to him, as the scripture says, under the cover of darkness. He's come in the nighttime to learn about Jesus and to, to talk to Jesus about his connection to God, which he believes he fully understands. He believes, he says, he says, we know, we know that you have come from God, as if Jesus is just another emissary. We know that you have come from God as if Jesus is just another preacher rolling through the countryside. We know that Jesus has come from God, and Nicodemus comes to talk to him about that. He tries to lead him in this time, Jesus does, past Nicodemus' uh, erroneous view that he can rely upon the signs that he has seen, the signs that maybe he's heard about, uh, as, as evidence that he is uh, 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 somebody who is sent by the divine. He's trying to help him to undertake a new identity, to help him to understand a new way of being, to help him to understand a new birth. And it's, if, you, if you're reading the text, you see that there are uh, a couple of ways of looking at this new birth. That, that word that, that is pulling from the Greek uh, is translated as uh, new birth as uh, 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 being born again, but also being born not just anew, but from above. There is a double meaning here, and Jesus is living in that place right there and trying to get Nicodemus to understand that you have to have this rebirth. And then he tries to go into water and spirit. He says, okay, so you're not getting the first thing. I'm going to come to you a different direction. You have to be born of water and of spirit. Uh, there is, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, they, there, there is a, a, an understanding of baptism. There is an understanding of ritual of purity that comes along with this water that the Jewish leader and Jewish people are familiar with already. There is this understanding of the spirit, the spirit move on the face of the waters. The, the penuma in the Greek is the ruach in the Hebrew. They understand where this is coming from. You need to be born of water and of spirit and from above, and yet Nicodemus is holding on to this old understanding that he has of Jesus, which is false. 
Oh, Jesus is a messenger of God. He's come. He's come with this understanding that we know who you are, and he's misunderstanding where Jesus is trying to take him. He still wonders, how is it possible to be born again, to be born anew, be born from above? How is it possible? And, and then Jesus, Jesus at the end, I, I don't know if you caught it, he says, as, as with the certainty that Nicodemus comes saying that I know who you are, and we know it, me as a member and a representative of my community, we know who you are. And Jesus asks him, how are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things. He comes back on him and flips it and says, how is it that you've come to tell me what you know when you don't get this basic concept? This is some serious business now. Jesus goes on and says some other things, but we're just going to focus in on this thing here, and I want to tell you this stuff from the topic that stakes is high. Stakes is high on Nicodemus. But stakes are, is high on us. I know that that may not sound like proper English to you, and before you correct my grammar, I just want to let you know that stakes is high is, a, is an album released by one of my favorite rap groups of all time. Somebody I was listening to when young Fred was a high school student in the person of De La Soul, and they released this album in 1996. And I know that you went down to the music store to get it on vinyl and on CD as you had. I know you went down there, Deaconess Bradman, to try and find De La Soul's most recent album so that you could have that in your collection. You, of course, remember, no doubt you remember, that this group has, uh, was an early and influential rap trio from Long Island with a very unique sound and a focus on originality with deep lyrics filled with wordplay and social commentary and all this encouragement for originality. They were called hippies because they looked strange. They had on colorful clothes and strange haircuts and, and, and talked about things in funny ways. It was poetic and you had to listen to it and listen to it again to try and understand the context and where it was that they were going. These were original members of the native tongues. You remember the native tongues, don't you? I'm sure you do, Minister Beckwith. Le Queen Latifah, Newark's own Queen Latifah, was a member of this rap collective. And, and these three uh, came with this album in 1996. Sadly, sadly, uh, Dave uh, Jolie Cruel missed the 50th anniversary. If you caught that at the Grammys, the performance, he could not go because he was sick and would be dead a week later, transitioned and departed this life. Well, um, as I know you were all patiently and anxiously awaiting, as was I, that their first six albums would be released to streaming platforms last Friday. And maybe you were up at Thursday at midnight trying to make sure that you could play your playlist and include De La Soul's music. I, I, you're laughing. Maybe some of you were not. But let me tell you that I couldn't wait to get up on Friday morning and take my daughter to school playing loudly that music I listened to when I was a 16-year-old junior bouncing through Paris with my headphones listening to the bootleg album that I had that somebody had recorded. When I would go to track meets listening to this and, and I would go to different places. And in college, you remember in college, maybe you didn't go to the parties at Manly like I did, but, uh, but we would sometimes go to parties and hear this music. And Stakes is High came out in 1996. I said all of that to say this. And here they have this text, which is in some way prophetic in this song, as they looked and tried to say things about the, the, uh, the direction of the music, the direction of the culture. They talked about consumerism and violence and racism and drug abuse and profiteering while some folk were still just focused on the party, where folks are talking about all the sweaters that they could purchase and all the things that they had, the guns, the this, the that. De La Soul was, was pushing against this trend in an early sense. And we have been, uh, 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 in many ways, denied their look. I hadn't heard this song in its entirety in, in many decades. But when we approach this biblical text, I think that we have to consider a couple of things like we do when we take apart these lyrics to songs. You try to figure out what it is 
they're saying, I know that you've sung along, Mama Say, Mama Sa, Mumaku Sa in your car as you went along, and, and somebody tried to say, no, he was saying, I'm, I will say I won't stop. And then you say, well, no, that's not what he was saying. He was saying, Mama Say, Mama Sa, Mumaku Sa, because it doesn't mean anything, but you could just sing it along. But sometimes you got to go deeper into the lyrics to try and understand what it is they're talking about. Otherwise, it's just words that you're hearing along with the music. And when we do this, we have to ask ourselves some questions. Who is in this text? What is happening? And what is, what is going to happen to the characters? And, and what, are the, what is at stake for those in the midst of the story? What is at stake for those that, that this is going on with? What, what do they stand to gain? What do they stand to lose? Nicodemus, the stakes is high for Nicodemus. Because he can't just go around just meeting with Jesus. He's a Pharisee. He can't just go around in the daylight trying to meet with Jesus and say, come on here, let's, you sit and talk with me, and I want to learn something. Even though he may come along with his own preconceived notions, he's not here telling Jesus that he's bound to die, that he can't be from God because of what he is saying like some of the others are. There are some things that he's dealing with that lead him to do some of the things that he's doing. But then what are the stakes if he is to get, let go of his preconceived notions and misconceptualizations, misconceptions? What are the stakes if he is to say, you know what, I got this hold on this conceptual Jesus and I'm not letting it go wrong as he is? What is at stake if he is to say, you know what, maybe I ought to go to Jesus and see if I could learn something, see if I could get somewhere, see if he might tell me something that might uh, 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 release me from my prison that might allow me to, to ascend to a higher height, that might give me something intellectually and, and spiritually that might beef me up and make it possible that I could live at a higher level. What can I learn from Jesus? Do I hold on to the same Jesus? Is the, the way I see Jesus today the same way I saw Jesus yesterday? Well, Jesus ain't changed, but maybe I need it to. You ever read a text, a biblical text, and you had a different understanding 10 years ago than you do today? The text didn't change. It hasn't been, in, been, been rewritten. Maybe it's been retranslated, but maybe God is dealing with you in a particular way and saying you need to know this. Maybe you've had some struggles and you now have a different understanding of what the text can mean. Same with Jesus. Somebody asked me a question, and I uh, recently when I was at a conference, and I said, well, I'm still learning Jesus. He said, how can it be that you are still learning Jesus? This is a young man. He's uh, in his second year at seminary, and, 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 and here, I, here am I preaching just uh, 10, 12 years and pastoring uh, four years. It's four years uh, this Sunday I joined you as the pastor-elect. Four years this Sunday. Don't clap. Don't, 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 don't clap. Four years this Sunday. I'm saying that. I'm saying that to say I'm still new at this, but I was telling the young man I'm still learning Jesus. How, sir, could it be? You're 52 years old. He didn't know my age because I don't look like I'm 52. But I know he, I know he didn't think I was 35 because I don't look like I'm 35 either. But he, 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 he said, uh, he said, how is that possible? And I said, because I've lived a little bit longer. I've, I've been through a few more things. I've, I've read a few other books. And the way I see Jesus today is not the way I saw Jesus 20 years ago. The Jesus that I'm holding on to is a different Jesus. Now, that's my conception. Did Jesus change? But how I see it, if you holding on to the same Jesus for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, let me tell you something. You might be not understanding where Jesus is trying to take you. You might have come to, to, to Jesus in the nighttime like Nicodemus did, saying, I know you. And Jesus is saying, hold on a second. How can you be here all this time and not know? But can somebody go and say something that, that, that is outside of their community? This person, Nicodemus, as he's leading these people, what if he were to say something to Jesus that is not what the community has told him he's able to say? Could that be something he might lose? 
You and I might have a conversation in a Bible study, and you might hear me say something that makes you uncomfortable. Good. Good. That's not a bad thing necessarily. But I, 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 I'm not going out here telling folks things that the community has not empowered me to say, but I'm telling you that sometimes you have to go back to your community and say something that may, may not be ready to hear all of a sudden, but it might be something that you have studied and been led to and have had revelation on, and now we're able to say with confidence, this is how I see it. But that might be a risk. Somebody may not like that. Sister Butterbean might get all trouble because I said the thing I said. Not that it was out of order or inappropriate, but that it was outside of what she was comfortable with. Some of these things are going to make us uncomfortable. Is Nicodemus afraid of being uncomfortable with what Jesus is saying? I think that De La Soul told us some things that we weren't comfortable hearing. And we left it alone. And we continued on a consumerist track. We continued on a violent track. We continued on a track that was okay with drug abuse and sexism and misogyny. And on this, on this first Sunday in, the, in Women's History Month, I'm not afraid to say that, that I've grown up in a hip-hop culture that has been sexist and misogynist. And that has seeming, not seemingly, but effectively and wholeheartedly in too many spaces sought to make sure that women saw themselves as lesser than. But not just our own culture, but our society looks at things that same way. And we are able to go on and, and hear, these, hear certain things, and we're okay with it. When, when you go back and listen to music, when you go back and watch movies, and you see some of the things that folks were talking about 15, 20, 30 years ago, it makes you uncomfortable. I, I was watching, and I'm not telling you that you got to go watch it, but I was watching Chris Rock on Netflix. You know he got slapped by Will Smith some months ago, and he was on Netflix this weekend live uh, in a new comedy routine talking about things. And, and I didn't get to the Will Smith parts, but I heard what he said with respect to how we respond to certain things in society and in the culture. And it's okay in too many places for us to just accept folk talking down to other people. It's okay in too many places for us to just, we got to be silent about the ways in which we've been victimized. It's okay in too many spaces for us to just say that the status quo is fine, and if you come against the status quo, somehow you are in this woke situation, and that's a bad place to be. I think that there are some things that are at stake for those who are in power and who got a few things, who have a few shekels to rub together that make them say that you cannot look for your own liberation. You cannot be about your own uh, end of your own oppression. And I think that where De La Soul was coming from in stakes as high is telling us that the stakes is high on us right now in our society, in our own context. The stakes are too high for us to be living under our own erroneous preconceived notions of who Jesus is. The stakes are too high. And, and, and there's a few things I want to say and then I want to sit down. Like Nicodemus, we have to be willing to go to Jesus. Now, he goes at nighttime when folk ain't going to see, but like Nicodemus, we got to be willing to at least sit down to, with Jesus. The stakes are too high on us in our society right now to think that we got the whole, that we know exactly where we are, that we, we got the true truth and don't nobody else have it, and, and, and we cannot learn anything else from what God is, with us has to say. The stakes are too high for us not to seek Jesus. The stakes are too high for us not to spend some time in this word. The stakes are too high for us not to spend time in prayer. The stakes are too high for us not to spend time in meditation. The stakes are too high for us not to be able to go out and look and live and live into that which Jesus has taught us. We have to keep seeking this Jesus. I'm still learning. You got to at least understand 
that you need to continue learning. You have not known all you need to know. And where we put God under our thumb saying we got the, I know it, I know it, I know it, I know it. No, you might know what you know, but that doesn't mean there's not more to add to that collection. You might have what you have, but that doesn't mean there's not more to put there. That, that doesn't mean that there's not some fine tuning and some refining that needs to go on. And you got to at least be willing to sit with Jesus and learn some things. The stakes is too high. For us, when we seek Jesus and we are reborn and being reborn from above and anew and being renewed by water and spirit, we need to have the courage to let Jesus teach us and lead us to where we ought to be. Not silently, not privately, but boldly and openly. We need to be able to say, I sat with Jesus. I've spent some time and I want to speak a liberating truth to somebody else to speak the liberative truth that Jesus offered, unafraid, unashamed of how we might be treated in the community from whence we come, because it might sound a little bit different than where what we've been used to hearing. We cannot think that our freedom is the only freedom that is important. Today, we recognize and commemorate Bloody Sunday, uh, uh, March 7th, 58 years ago, where almost 60 people, were hurt and harmed, injured by the Alabama State Police, many of whom are on horseback. They hit John Lewis so hard and so often that they gave him a skull fracture. And, 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 and they beat these people on the Lord's Day who were trying to peacefully walk across what I have now started to call the John Lewis Bridge because the state of Alabama is not going to change that name anytime soon from Edmund Pettus, who was a Klan leader, a grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. So I'm saying, just like we sang a new birthday song, black folks know that we got a new birthday song since Stevie Wonder started this song with, for, for, for Martin Luther King's birthday, and now that's our birthday song. To where you go to a party or where we recognize the birthday with black people, they are going to sing. You know. They walked across the John Lewis Bridge and got beaten. They beat women. They beat men. They beat teenagers. They beat children. They beat these people simply because they were walking and looking for voting rights. Do you know that many people equated the struggle for civil rights that black folks were fighting with the fact that they saw their Jesus saying, no, you are not equal to me? There was a religious thread that ran through the Ku Klux Klan to where members of the Klan could be in church, leave to go do something, and come back to church. There was evil in the land, and they were using Jesus to cosign that evil. Segregation had a religious justification. Enslavement had a religious justification. Sexism has a religious justification. Abortion has a religious justification justification. And these things ought not be. Some of y'all might have been a little, hey, I don't know where he's going with this. But you know, there are places in this country where they want to tell queer folk that you can't be queer and still have this job. You can't be queer and still live in this home. You can't be queer and still express yourself certain ways. You can't be a man and wear women's clothes. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I've been a man all my, all my adult life. I've been male all my life. I don't wear dresses. That's my choice. I don't wear makeup. That's my choice. This is the way I live my life. But you ought not be held to a standard that says you will lose your freedoms that this country is supposed to stand for if you do certain things. And if you think your freedom because you're black is owed to you and their freedom because they're queer should be denied to them, maybe that's why we don't have our full freedom and citizenship today. And I have to tell you that I don't think Jesus is telling them people that they can't live in an apartment, that they can't have a job, that you can't have a job? You mean to tell me somebody want to take your job? Let me tell you something. Yes. 
You mean to tell me if somebody has an ectopic pregnancy and that fetus is not going to make it because it's living outside the womb, they can't have an abortion safe, legal, protective of the life of the mother? You mean to tell me you think Jesus is behind that? Yes, they do. And they are making it hard for people to live and to live with dignity. You mean to tell me that you believe that it's right that Jesus is behind separating children at the border and making young people who come here to work at 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 years old in places that they ought not be working? You mean to tell me that Jesus is behind this, telling you that it's okay for the Equal Rights Amendment never to have been ratified, to make sure that women don't have to work until October the next year, in the case of black women, to make what a white man made that one year, and that's okay with you in this so-called Christian nation? The stakes is too high, beloved. The stakes is too high for those of us who believe in Jesus and believe in a Jesus who wants our liberation right here. Hey, you know what? We ought to be feeding more people. Uh, in our church, we, we can feed people. We can feed people. We got a kitchen that's not in use more than seven days a week. We can feed people, and we ought to do some of that. I ain't hear too many amens, but we, we, can, we can do that. We can do that. We ought to be feeding some people. But why is it necessary for us to feed people? You mean to tell me that Jesus isn't for people having enough to eat without coming through our doors to be fed? For just, just in general? You mean to tell me that you think your Jesus isn't for a $15 minimum wage so people can live? You know, minimum wage where it was? You can't live in a two-bedroom apartment working 40 hours a week on $7.50 an hour anywhere in this nation and rent an apartment. You can't do that anywhere in the nation, not on one 40-hour-a-week job. It's not possible, not per the averages. But that's where we are. And we have to be open and notorious and bold with this saying, Jesus ain't for some of this foolishness. And it's okay for us to do that from our faith because we've seen where our right-wing partners have used their faith to say certain things about how things ought to be. And they brought folks together like a, like a, like a jihad. And they said, we're going into it. Beloved, we got to be more animated with the Jesus that we know and be bold with that which we are saying Jesus is calling us to. Yes, I believe in salvation. And if you don't know the truth of Jesus, I believe that there is a place for you and it's not too cool. But I do also believe this, that Jesus came for liberation, that Jesus came to love somebody. And the stakes is too high for us to be silent on what Jesus is saying to us with respect even to the public square. This ought to permeate some of our conversations. This ought to permeate our teaching with our young people. We ought to bring Jesus into these conversations and not just say, you know what, that, dog on, that doggone raggedy Trump, this, that, and the other. Yeah, 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 you can have that conversation like that. But this is bigger than him. This is what Jesus is saying to us. And if we can pull Jesus out of just this Good Friday moment and make it so that we look at Jesus across the society, maybe, just maybe, everybody ain't going to be Christian. I'm going to tell you that right now. Everybody's not going to follow behind what you got to say. But if you can love them, if you can show that God loves them and so do you, if you can say that God's love that lives in me means that you should be able to live with dignity that you should be able to live with the same freedoms that I live with, that you should be able to have something in this world that doesn't require you to have to go begging for your food every day. If you can be like that, even if you don't agree with how they live their life, even if you don't agree with the identity that they have, you don't have to. Now, I'm not telling you you do. But you got to stand up for their rights. You got to stand up for their life and their being, and their, their right to life. Somebody told me, my daughter told me one day, my teacher's a pro-lifer. I said, you know what, so am I. I'm a pro-lifer. I want people to be able to live and to live with dignity. I want people, mothers, fathers, children, adults, whether you got babies, whether you don't have babies, you ought to be able to live. And as I sit with Jesus and try to learn something, I want to be able to say, Jesus, how do I say it? I want to be able to say, Jesus, am I right in saying it? 
I want to learn how to say, Jesus, am, am, what do you need me to do? Because the stakes is too high for me to sit around and pretend like this doesn't have theological implications. The stakes is too high. The stakes is too high for another reason. Because who you are and who you think of yourself to be may not be who it is that God wants you to be forever. The stakes is high because there's something in you that God wants out of you. I don't know what that is. But I had to sit with God one day. I had to sit and say, I want to know what it is that you need from me and how do I get to where I'm going? And if I'm able to hear what you have to say, I want to let go of this preconceived notion I have of myself, this misappropriation of my own potential, this misunderstanding of where it is that I'm supposed to be and that I'm supposed to go. And when I heard it, I said, no, I'm too old to go back to school. And God said, no, you're not. I'm too old for this. I'm too old for that. How can I make this happen? How can I do this? I've got a million excuses. And then I got shown something that said, this is where I want you and how it is to go. And I had to let go of that thing that I was holding on to. Who has desires? Who has dreams? Who has beliefs? Who has something that you're looking for? Well, Jesus was able to show you how to get there. But you got to be willing to let go of something. you got to be willing of, to let go of something. Something that you're going to have to let go. It might not just be some money. It might not just be some comfort. It might not just be some, some, something. It might be the vision of you that you have in yourself. It might be your own understanding of who you are. But let me tell you something. The stakes is high. And it's too high not to know the truth about who you are and who you should be and where you can go. The stakes are too high. I consider in this Women's History Month, Jarena Lee, who lived in, Cher in, in, in Cape May, New Jersey. And today she's recognized as a preacher in the AME church, but they wouldn't let her preach when she was alive. Uh, they told her she couldn't do things because she's a woman. I'm thinking about Pauli Murray. I'm thinking about Prathia Hall. I'm thinking about Yvette Flunder, who've been told things about themselves because of who they were. But they are gifted. I'm thinking about even... Uh, 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 Bernadette Glover, who I heard a story about Dr. Bernadette Glover, pastor of the St. Paul uh, Baptist Church, who had a dream to preach, and they, they, and they tried to keep her from being who she is. And now she is one of the most sought-after preachers in this area. She is one of the pastors that pastors go to when they need to know something. And she blessed me on multiple occasions. Where would I be if it were not for Dr. Bernadette Glover, whose grandfather's name is on our annex, but who is making an impact in herself? Where would we be if somebody told her something and she just didn't sit with Jesus long enough to realize that they done lied to her and they lied to her about other things? I'm not telling y'all that y'all everybody called to preach. I'm not telling you that you are, that you aren't. I'm telling you that who you are might not be who God intends for you to remain. And the stakes are too high on you and on our community to let it rest the way it is, to just live in the status quo. I'm here to tell you that God is able to do new works even in you. Even though you've been with Jesus all this time, there is a new identity that you might be able to have. I'm telling you that your abilities can be augmented. I'm telling you that your boundaries can be broad and your capabilities can be colossal. Your direction can be doctored and maybe you'll find yourself going in new places. Your environment can be enlightened. Your graciousness can be grossed up. Your hospitality can be heightened in this moment if we would just walk over on to Jesus in the light and listen to what he's saying. Your functionality can be freshened. Your hospitality heightened. Your infrastructure can be increased so that you have new opportunity to move forward. 
Your journey made just, your knowledge newly conceived, your limits have been lengthened, your mind made over. Your notions are new and improved. If you will only go and sit and seek God, your opportunities overhauled, your perspective properly adjusted, your questions will have new quality because you're looking to how you can be better. Your radical love can be rekindled, your substance sanctified, your territory tacked on to, your unction unleashed, your vision revised, your work widened, your experience embellished, your yearnings have new yardsticks to take you beyond where you want it. Your zone can be rezoned. If you and me would only seek Jesus like Nicodemus did, but let go of that thing that Nicodemus wasn't willing to let go of. What I'm trying to tell you is that wherever you are, there can be more for you. Whatever you're doing can be expanded. Whatever you are focused on, maybe you need to focus in another area so that God can use you. And one day, you'll look back and wonder how it was that you got over. You'll wonder how it was that you made it. And you'll look at the blessing and say, what if I didn't do that? The stakes are too high for us to sit around and pretend like there's not more to do or even more to learn. And just by virtue of being here in the house, that's a great start. Now let's go to work. Now let's get busy. Now let's go beyond. And no telling what will come. Greater name, Christ you stay.